Today we're joined by Bianca Caramento from the Bay Area Climate Change Council and I'm really excited to have her join us and we're going to be talking about their organization and the great work that they've been doing the last few years as well as uh, the work that they're continuing to do. So thanks for joining me Bianca and I'm wondering can you maybe just start by telling us who the heck is the Bay Area Climate Change Council and how did you come to be? Absolutely. So thanks for having me, Pam. It's really, it's it's an honor to be here and to chat with you today. So Bay Area Climate Change Council uh, came out of, of work between the Hamilton Chamber of Commerce and the Burlington Chamber of Commerce. Uh, they were having uh, an event where they realized that that really the Bay Area, because we're so connected in terms of commerce, land, geography, it makes a lot of sense when we're looking at larger issues, things like climate change as an example, or economic development, that we should really be thinking about it in a regional sort of approach so as to not reinvent the wheel. So the two chambers came together with this idea, and then the two cities sort of took it from there. City of Burlington and City of Hamilton decided to come together and look at the ways that they could sort of tackle the climate crisis uh, in unison. And as part of doing that, they created the Bay Area Climate Change Office between the two cities, and then they started getting different folks around the table. So the Bay Area Climate Change Council, as it stands today, is made up of about 14 organizations from the two cities, and it ranges significantly in terms of who's involved. So we have the two cities involved, of course, but we also have some environmental organizations, folks like Burlington Green, uh, Environment Hamilton, sort of folks that you would imagine being part of a climate change collective, but we also have some some players that are sort of outside those those sort of typical suspects. So uh, we include both the chamber in Hamilton as well as economic development in Burlington. We include United Way. We include the Hamilton Regional Indian Center. So it's a really broad collective uh, of folks that are coming to the table and, and recognizing that climate change is an issue that we're we're looking to address. And so in terms of the Bay Area Climate Change Council and what it's there to do, uh, our goal is, is pretty simple. Uh, it's, it matches the two cities in terms of what we're hoping to achieve, which is a 50% reduction in GHGs by 2030 and net zero by 2050. That's amazing. And I love the combination of the council because we know that combating climate change is also good for business. But by having the United Way in there, you're also looking at the social determinants and how um, climate in, climate change can impact, um, you know, uh, the social determinants. And, and I mean, it, it really is um, very inclusive so that you've got a lot of voices at the table and, and making sure that those voices are all part of the solution, right? Absolutely. One of the, the things that, that we are really cognizant of uh, at back is uh, this concept of the just transition. So as we're sort of making that transition uh, into a low carbon future, what voices are we making sure that we recognize and, and taking along the way and, and considering how certain policies can impact lower income individuals. Uh, and we can talk about that a little bit, about, a little bit later in terms of examples, but um, for us, it's really important that we're keeping everybody at the table and making sure that as we transition, we're not leaving anybody behind, one, but two, how can we also improve their circumstances through that low carbon transition? So that's what BAC really focuses on, and we want to make sure we have those voices at the table. Well, since you brought it up, let's talk about those examples. Have you have you got some that... Um... Absolutely. So uh, a key example uh, in terms of sort of a typical policy that you'll see that includes the just transition actually includes the, the federal carbon pricing. So right now, the federal government uh, in its existing form for the for the carbon price includes that revenue neutrality piece where depending on your income, you get a certain amount of revenue back from from the carbon price. And that would be an example of how you can avoid some of the negative impacts of something like a price on carbon on folks who are lower income, because it means that they actually get back, in the case of the current federal government, their money and then some in terms of the impact of, of the policy. So that's an example of sort of a just transition policy. Where BAC's concerned, one of the areas that we're really cognizant of is always ensuring that when we're coming up with our own policies and suggesting to lift different levels of government, we include those voices at the table to make sure that the suggestions that we're bringing forward consider their perspectives and we avoid any future, any additional harm and potentially trying to ameliorate any existing. That's great. That's, that's really terrific. Um, I know in 2018, you did a GHG inventory. Um, can you maybe explain uh, or tell us what you found and also how you're using that to inform 
inform uh, some of the work that you're doing. Absolutely. So like you mentioned, we did a, a GSG inventory of the two cities to understand sort of where the GSGs are coming from. And as a result, where should VAC be sort of focusing its efforts on? So what we found is that 95% of our region's emissions come from three sectors, those being buildings, transportation, and industry. And so uh, as a result, BAC's work has, has largely been focused on those three sectors. Now the remaining 5% of emissions, uh, so you might get things like agriculture or waste would, would contribute to that remaining 5%. BAC's supportive of those sorts of initiatives that would tackle emissions there, but we're really focused on the big three. And so to understand the breakdown of the big three, uh, when we're looking at buildings, we're talking about mostly the, the pollution and, and the GHGs that come out of heating and cooling and powering our homes. And that accounts for about 18% of our region's emissions. We look at transportation, we're talking about burning, burning gasoline and, and diesel in our cars, our SUVs, and even our light freight for deliveries and things like that. And that accounts for about 20% of the overall GHGs in our region. And then finally, when it comes to industrial emissions, we're looking at about just about 60% of the Bay Area GHG emissions. So that's a huge, huge section. Uh, and so our work and, and the initiatives that we have planned are sort of targeted appropriately to look at those three main sectors and how can we reduce them while maintaining that just transition principle that we talked about a moment ago, while encouraging that economic development and recognizing that when we look at the climate crisis, it really is the biggest opportunity of the 21st century as far as business goes. Like that's how we're sort of looking at it as an opportunity for economic growth, for, for a just transition and sort of promoting some policies that reflect that, that view. Well, and if you look at, um, and I know it's outside of, of your area, but Ford of Canada has transitioned to electric vehicle uh, construction. General Motors, we all yeah. thought GM was leaving Oshawa and now they're retooling to, to um, create electric vehicles. And my gosh, I just see, saw an ad on the weekend with Will Farrell. Um, GM had done, you know, challenging Norway to make the U.S the number one for EVs. So there is a real um, push by industry to see how they can, uh, they can pivot and, and, and to, because it's good for their business future. It's not just, it's not just the right thing to do, but economically it's, it's, it's good for them as well. And, and I think that's probably, and I'm sure you've looked at this, but that's, that's a role where the government can help is to help businesses and industry make that transition so that it's yeah. not as uh, cost prohibitive for them to do that. Absolutely. And it's really exciting to see the different car companies coming out with, with not just their commitments, but now actually we're starting to see the models sort of starting to roll out now where people are, are seeing that this isn't sort of just a niche thing anymore. This is really looking to be the transition of the main sort of type of vehicle that's going to be on market sooner rather than later, hopefully. So that's exciting to see. And one of the areas that BAC is sort of looking at when it comes to that, that low carbon vehicle option is one, we're, we're trying to be uh, agnostic when it comes to the type of low carbon vehicle. So whether that ends up being a, an electric vehicle that someone drives or potentially depending on the type of vehicle and the use, it may be a hydrogen powered vehicle as an example. So, so long as it's zero carbon, we're all for it at, at back. And I think one of the things that we're trying to contribute to the overall puzzle is understanding some of, uh, some of the nuances in terms of the types of vehicles that we're ultimately gonna need. Because So you have the residential vehicles that are pretty straightforward. You have your SUVs, your trucks, your, your sedans. But when we're looking at commercial fleets, and making sure that businesses are able to swap, switch over. We need to make sure that the low carbon options actually work in the day to day. So I'll give you an example. When you're looking at, for example, if you have a fleet uh, for a landscaping company, the sort of vehicles that they would need and, and, and what those vehicles need to be able to do in the field might currently be beyond the capacity of a low carbon option for their fleet from, to make it actually viable for them in the day-to-day. -day. So we're looking to sort of work with different companies in different, in different sectors to understand what their vehicle needs are and trying to communicate that to both uh, those who are, who are making the low carbon vehicles, but also the government in case there are instances in which, you know, maybe there's some R&D that's needed in this area. Maybe there's some support that's needed in that area. So we're trying to understand the gaps and then communicate it to those who can make a difference. And you're working with Mohawk College, right? Maybe you can talk a little bit about that partnership. Yeah, absolutely. So our three ex officio members for BAC is the, the 
City of Burlington, City of Hamilton, and Mohawk College. So we're lucky to have our administrative home at uh, Mohawk College. We work really closely with the Center for Climate Change Management, uh, who are working on a lot of the same sort of initiatives as back, and they support us in our work, and we support them. So oftentimes what, what ends up happening is we partner on a number of different projects, uh, and we're able to sort of work with the college, the incredible research team that they have going on there with with bright minds, young minds, being able to, to help out and partner with community um, actors in both Burlington and Hamilton so that we can hopefully uh, find some of those solutions that are based on research, based on, on the work of the college and, and help local companies and organizations lower their GHGs. It's such a great model, a great, great model that you've developed. And the, the inventory that you did, how has that helped inform uh, your members, including the municipalities in the in the work that they're doing? I think our inventory has really helped in being able to sort of focus people in terms of understanding where the effort needs to sort of be placed on. Sometimes, because climate change is such a huge issue, it's so complex, there's so many things that contribute to it. Frankly, almost everything that we do in a day-to-day -day basis has some sort of carbon output, everything. And so because it's that vast and because it's so complex, sometimes we get really caught up in, in, in smaller, uh, definitely GHG contributors, but perhaps not necessarily the biggest culprits, right? So, so the GHG inventory has really helped with being able to focus people down in terms of, okay, we only have so much effort and so much resources at the end of the day, right? And so how we spend our time and our resources really does matter when we have such a short timeline for climate action. And so our inventory has helped and sort of guided where the attention is sort of mostly being drawn to and making sure that our actions are as effective as possible. Well, that's great. So you just mentioned like climate change is such a huge daunting crisis, right? And sometimes individuals, whether it's a, you know, whether it's a, a person or a business can go, well, it's so big. Can I, is there anything I can do that's really going to make a difference? I'm just, I'm just one person. I'm just one business. What are some of the things that people can do? Um, to help out for to sure. Help so, out, yeah. So when we look at those two biggest sectors, right, we look at buildings and transportation are among those big three, right? And I think that people can have a direct impact in their own lives or their own choices when they look at those two sectors in particular. And so some of the choices that that can um, that you can that someone could make that reflect those two sectors. Uh, so when we look at buildings, for example, uh, whether someone chooses to retrofit their home could be one way of potentially reducing their GHGs. And now we're cognizant of the fact that you know saying, "Well, just retrofit your home," as if you know any just anyone could do that, just anyone could afford that. We're we're not mistaken in thinking that. And so part of what BAC is working on right now is, is figuring out a program to be able to help people to do that, because that's not necessarily within reach of most people, quite frankly. And so we want to make it more in reach for, for anyone who wants to and is able to do so. In the interim, some of the, the things that, that, that you can do that are smaller measures to be able to perhaps not lower your, your, your house or your apartment's GHGs, but offset it would be the purchase of offsets. And that's always an option that's on the table that's usually pretty quick to um, and easy to access. Bullfrog's uh, one, of, one of the major go-tos that's local. Um, when it comes to transportation, any way in which you can, once again, we, we can't just say, you know, just buy an EV, just go buy an EV. That's much easier said than done. Uh, and so once again, it's looking at, okay, do I always need to take my car to where I'm going? Is it in walking distance? Perhaps when it's negative 15, we don't <laughs> necessarily walk to, to just about anywhere, no matter how close it is, and I can understand that. But asking these questions about, can I ride my bike? Can I walk? Can I take public transit to wherever it is that I wanna go? Uh, is a way that you could lower your, your GHGs in terms of transportation as well. There are also offsets available for transportation uh, GHGs that people can purchase. One of the things that BAC is trying to do to make it easier to make those choices, because we recognize that sometimes those choices, one, aren't affordable, which is, which is a barrier. Two, potentially they're not necessarily as safe or perceived to be as safe as just getting in your own car and going where you need to go. Cycling is one of those areas where a lot of folks don't feel like it's safe enough to take that option, though they might want to. Uh, and also just in terms of, of time, sometimes folks rightly perceive that it's going to take them a lot longer to get to wherever they have to go if they have to figure out transit schedules, if they have to wait for the bus, if it takes a long time. 
So what BAC's trying to do is trying to make those choices for lower carbon options easier and more affordable and more efficient. So we're working with the two cities, Burlington and Hamilton, to be able to make their transit systems, their biking infrastructure more effective to sort of address some of those potential barriers and also working with um, understanding what it would take to improve uptake of EV or low carbon vehicles as well, because there are some, some barriers associated there. So those are the two areas I think people can really try and work on in their own sort of lives uh, to, to, to make an impact. But it, it really does go without saying that it's very difficult. It's a huge complex issue and it can feel like a lot. Uh, and so I don't think you know, placing the entire sort of burden on the individual is, is necessarily the way to go. And it's not necessarily going to solve all the problems. But for those who are able and willing to sort of do a small part in the overall battle, I think there's always work to be done for sure. Well, and I remember um, I used to head up an organization called Cycle Oakville, and one of the fellows did a, um, an Excel spreadsheet about the actual time it took um, because most trips are within two kilometers. And so he had done, you know, the, the time involved riding your bike to get someplace versus driving and incorporated into the driving was the amount of time it took to find a parking space and walk to whatever you were going to. And so it, there, there is, a, um, and it's, it's a much greater distance than you would think. It's actually faster on your bike. So so it, it was, it was it, I think sometimes there's an education there as well, or educating people about, um, like, not everybody is, is feels comfortable riding on, on the street, educating them about how they can get from point A to point B in a timely manner. And something else that has is come out, and I've been trying to push the government to offer rebates on, are um, e-assist bikes. Uh, because, you know, sometimes that will take away the, you know, you don't want to arrive at a meeting all hot and sweaty, you've got to ride up a hill to get someplace, but it actually in Europe, it's the fastest growing segment of, of cycling transportation, and it, it makes a huge difference in that distance, and I know there was a fellow here who lived in Oakville, and he worked downtown Burlington, it took him 20 minutes to ride his bike from um, Dundas and Brawny Road to downtown Burlington, well, there's no way you could drive that fast. And Burlington has got a great crosstown um, bike path, multi-use trail that, that goes sort of diagonally across the city. So he was able to take advantage of that on his, his electric bike and get down there quite quickly. So there's, there's education involved as well, where there's a perception that you can't do something when in fact uh, you can. And if you look at Ottawa, people always would say to me, yeah, but we, it's, it's, we get snow and it's winter here. And if you look at Ottawa, you see a ton of people still riding bikes. And in Madison, Wisconsin, they've plowed the bike lanes before they plow the roads. So that's a, that's a municipality that's made the choice that we're going to encourage people to ride their bikes in the winter by plowing those bike lanes before we actually even do the roads. So there's, there's certainly ways around it. Listen, so you're, you're doing something March the 9th. So maybe you could we tell are. us a little bit about that. Yeah, we're very excited. So on March 9th, we're hosting our annual climate change forum. And this year is going to be a really fun one. So it's all virtual, of course, because of COVID and everything that's going on. But on March 9th in the evening from 630 to 8pm, we're going to be hosting our forum where we're going to have a number of speakers uh, sort of talk about something that I think is relevant to each and every one of us. So oftentimes, when we're sitting down with either family or friends, Obviously, in COVID times, it would just be within your existing bubble, of course. But when you're sh sitting down and talking to the folks that you know, sometimes there's those awkward conversations that come up when it comes to political difference. And perhaps when you're talking about climate change, there's a little bit of a disconnect if folks don't necessarily have the same view of climate change. And so we have Catherine Hayhoe, who is an award-winning climate scientist, and actually she's a viral TED Talk host, uh, who's going to be talking about how do we have those conversations in an effective way so that we can we can speak to our friends, we can speak to our family on climate change and actually have a productive conversation. So um, we're gonna have her sort of kick off the keynote and then we're gonna follow that up with a number of panelists uh, from um, Climate Action Network Canada, from the Atmospheric Fund, as well as Dan Lombot from Trent University, sort of bring that to the local context, understand, okay, when we think about Burlington, when we think about Hamilton, what are some of the key conversations that are being had and how do we apply 
the lessons that we learned from, from Catherine in the local context so we can have a more productive conversation about climate change. So we're really excited. It's going to be a great event, all online, free, of course, uh, and it should be, it should be a good time. So we're including a link to that in the in in the description for this this talk. So uh, make sure you sign up March 9th, 630 to 8 and then there's no charge, um, which is fantastic. Um, anything else you want to touch on? I mean, this has just been terrific. So thank you so much, Bianca. Thank you. It's been great chatting with you. I, I, I love the opportunity to do so and anytime we can we can chat further. We're looking forward to doing so. And you're on how do people find you if they want to get more information? So we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, we're on Instagram. Uh, if you search a Bay Area climate, you will find us right away. And, and we're happy to engage with any sort of questions uh, or, or requests for further information from anyone who wants to chat. We're always welcome and, and interested in having further conversation. That's awesome. Well, thanks so much. Thank you.